Hello and welcome to All Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Murray of Drea Renee Knits and this is a little weekly knitting, making, creating podcast where I do my best to answer some of the questions that y'all have sent in for me. So we might as well just kick it off with a big old thank you saying I can do this every week if y'all didn't keep asking me questions. So thank you so much to each and every one of you who sends in your questions. And I've got some pretty good ones today. We'll jump to, um, I'm currently wearing my stone crop pullover. This was a Rhinebeck sweater from, I think like four years ago. And it's so fun, you know, being a knitwear designer, I have a lot of hand knit sweaters. <laughs> And it's really easy to be like, ooh, shiny, new, what's what's my newest sweater? Uh, then it's really fun to actually pull an oldie but a goodie out of the closet and be like, oh my gosh, why don't I wear this one more often? So this is knit up in spin cycle yarns dyed in the wool and magpie fibers domestic fingering, which they don't have their domestic anymore, right? That's the one. Yeah, they don't have the domestic anymore. It was a really lovely yarn. So for any of y'all out there who still have some of it in your stash, treasure it. I've got a few skeins left, um, but they have all kinds of great other fingering weight yarns you could sub in. You could even do a sport weight and I think it would work up really nicely. So anyways, this is stone crop pullover. There's also a cardigan version for those of you who feel like being brave and sticking, cutting into your knitting. That's a really a fun one too. All right, let's get to some questions. I've read about mixed experiences in traveling with needles domestically or internationally. I know you've previously shared about having no issues traveling domestically, but I would love to hear more about your recent retreat to Mexico since it's an international location. Did you or any of the retreat attendees have issues with your knitting needles traveling to or from Mexico? checked baggage or carry on any additional tips to share um, so mexico is one of the places that there is a potential to have your knitting needles taken away from you as you go through security so uh, other places i've gone to australia scotland france the netherlands Canada. I've not had any issues and I typically travel. I've shown y'all my knitting case before. I don't have it up here because I'm actually getting ready for another trip tomorrow um, to go teach at the Knit Social Retreat, which is in Canada. So I'm, I've been packing, but um, I have quite the needle case that I generally carry because even when I'm traveling to teach and things like that, I still have to keep up with my day-to-day -day work. And so I'm always designing and everything when I'm on the road and I like to have anything I might need. So I usually travel with my needle case, which is at least a double set of the ones I usually take with me are my chow goos, which are metal tips. Uh, I had heard that Mexico can be a tricky one for getting your needles taken. A few people have had that experience. So on the way there, leaving from the U.S., if that's where you're departing from, I, you know, is no issue. It's not going to be any different. If generally wherever you live, you can travel domestically on planes and there's no problem with your knitting needles and you don't have to worry about that end of it. It's just the coming back. Now, for me, I would really struggle to be on a five hour flight without my knitting <laughs> I think I got a little stare crazy. So I just planned ahead. I chose to use my wood needles. I have the Luca wood needles and I do have fairly short tips. I like like their three inch tips to the four inch, uh, which I also think just look a little bit less problematic, I suppose. I highly recommend traveling with interchangeable an interchangeable needle where you can take off the tips and put on, <clears throat> excuse me, your stoppers that like the cord toppers. That way, if they are not okay with you going through with those needle tips, you can, you're only losing the needle tips and you have your knitting and your cord safe. So I do recommend that. Make sure I, so before I even got to the airport, I took off all my needle tips for my project, all of my needle tips, all two of the needle tips. And I took those off and put my stoppers on. That way, if there was any issues, I wouldn't lose my knitting. Um, <clears throat> that being said, with my little wood tips, I mean, they're also not very sharp. 
they're a lot more dull than the middle tips. I'm just gonna take a drink of water. I swear all of a sudden the air in here just got thick. It's almost, I have an orchid right here and I almost feel like it's like perfumey. I'll show you guys though, because it's really pretty. This is what I came home to. It bloomed, it had four new blooms on it. Um, okay, so back to traveling. So that's what I would recommend is to play it safe. You may or may not get through with your knitting if you're really worried about it or you are not willing to sacrifice your needle tips if they don't allow it through, then I would just go ahead and pack that in your luggage. Of course you can pack knitting in your luggage, that's not a problem. Um, but if you want to carry it on and be able to knit on the plane, that's what I would recommend. I would use a pair of wooden needles where you can screw off the tops so worst comes to worst, you only lose the needle tips. Um, but yeah, I was fine going through with those little three inch wood ones. All right. I've heard you talk about ways that you fit knitting time in either by either knitting while walking or bringing your knitting bag with you around the house. But have you ever shared your favorite way to knit for a long time? Since knitting is your job, do you have long stretches of knitting in your days or do you break it up into smaller chunks? Do you have a favorite place or way to sit when you're knitting for a long time? Do you watch movies, listen to music, prefer silence? Do you have tips on staying comfortable for long stretches of knitting? So I do sometimes have stretches of time where I am knitting for a few hours. I do try to break that up, even if it's just like getting up to stretch my legs and go to the bathroom, make a cup of tea, fill up my water bottle, things like that. I mean, in general, I think it's better for us to not sit for hours without getting up. That being said, I've definitely done it before, especially when I am like really got to get some knitting done on a project. Um, but generally speaking, I do break it up into chunks of time. So kind of a typical look at my day is I wake up, I drink a large glass of water with lemon in it. I won't get that detailed. Um, I have my coffee though in the morning and I almost always knit with my coffee in the morning. If I'm not knitting, then I'm probably spinning or maybe sneaking in some sewing like a different craft. But a lot of times, I'll knit in the morning for the half hour or so it takes me to drink my coffee. Then I get up, exercise, do all that kind of stuff. And then once I get back to work, I do my computer work because my brain definitely functions better earlier in the day than later. I'm very much a morning person. Um, I reward myself for getting through my computer work with more knitting. <laughs> so then in the afternoon, I'll return to knitting, uh, usually for the second part of my day. And again, a lot of times it's broken up, a kid might need me or things like that. So I wouldn't say that I'm just like power knitting for hours on end. Um, and then, you know, we have, I always make dinner, we have family time, put our kids down. And then a lot of times I'll knit for a little bit longer in the evening if my husband and I watch a show or a movie together or um, I'm listening to my book or something, it depends. I do go to bed pretty early. <laughs> so I don't always get the nighttime knitting. Um, and when I'm knitting, I'm almost always listening to an audiobook. I go through a lot of books. Please feel free to put your favorite audiobook recommendations in the comments below because I go through a lot of them and I'm always looking for more. I also love a good podcast. If anybody has any podcasts they're really, really loving right now, also feel free to throw that in the comments below. Um, so yeah, I listen to a ton of audiobooks and some podcasts. I don't generally watch a lot of stuff. Um, sometimes I'll go through phases when there's a new great show, you know, or it's the new season of British Bake Off comes out or something fun like that. Um, but I don't watch a ton of like TV and stuff. I just find I'm not as interested in that as I am in a really good audiobook. Um, as far as how I sit or anything related to my physiology as I'm knitting, I am all over the show. I've got a comfy chair. I don't know if y'all are going to be able to see it right there. That pink chair back there. Do you, I, I never, there it is. Boop, that one. Sometimes I'll sit there. A lot of times I do sit cross-legged, um, like crisscross applesauce style, which I don't think you're supposed to do. Sometimes I do like to put my feet up. Sometimes I just prop my feet up on a chair next to me or something. Um, so I don't know that my ergonomics are awesome for knitting, 
but I just kind of get comfortable and I tend to move around quite a bit. Um, I do highly recommend if you are somebody who are like, I want to knit for longer stretches, doesn't feel like my body will let me. I definitely recommend Carson Demers. Uh, his books are classes. He's, I think, Ergo I Knit or Ergo Knits. One of those two on Instagram, social media. And he's all about the ergonomics of keeping your body safe while knitting so that you can knit for longer in your lifetime. So that's a really, really great resource. I definitely get questions asking for stretches and things like that. I don't do anything super special. You know, I, I like to do this. I oftentimes, like they, these kind of stretches, pulling my fingers back and stretching out this area tends to feel really good for me. Um, I don't do anything super fancy besides that. Sometimes if I have a really long stretch of knitting to do and I don't want to just sit there all even, just walk circles. <laughs> In my studio like a little knitting bag uh just to get up and moving so that's kind of it oh I will say too you know I've been knitting for a really long time I learned when I was about nine and returned to it in my teens so I've got quite a few couple decades under my belt of knitting and for the first probably 20 years I knit English style and then when I started teaching I switched to continental not because I meant to but I needed to learn continental so when I was doing demonstrations in class I could show either way so that all my students could see the way they knit in the demonstration and one day I just realized oh every time I'm picking up my knitting I'm knitting continental and that really did help relieve some of my hand like repetitive strain injury and things like that that I had going on. I also used to have really bad carpal tunnel from baking. And I think that when I was knitting English style, it would trigger a little bit of that. But Continental seems to have really helped. So if you've been knitting for a really long time, it might be worth it to try learning the opposite style in which you knit because it's gonna work your hand muscles just a bit differently in your wrists and everything. So that might actually help give you some relief if you're feeling any soreness. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. If anybody else has any tips they love, I am pretty sure, so I did teach one retreat with Carson and I'm trying to remember some of the tips he gave us. And I do think you are supposed to, you know, set with your feet on the ground, <laughs> not, not tucked up cozy into a chair, but okay. Next question. So I make sure I didn't skip one here. Okay. Like a lot of people in the fiber world, I started knitting at a young age, then slowly fell down the fiber rabbit hole as I got older, with spinning being my go-to, besides knitting, of course. I have always wanted to spin a woolly sock yarn, something besides merino. I live in the Colorado mountains and love hand-knit woolly socks for being outside. Do you have any recommendations? I just said that weird. Did I say recommendations? Re recommendations on what fiber and or fiber blends to spin that would hold up well for socks and how many plies would you recommend so I am always on the lookout for more information on spinning for socks I really love to spin for socks it's one of my go-to's especially if I only have maybe a single bat or braid of yarn I know I can get a pair of socks out of that so it's a nice go-to if I don't want to think too heavily of a plan and I just want to spin a lot of times I'll default to a sock yarn I generally spin a three-ply, like a traditional three-ply sock yarn. Sometimes I'll do a three-ply fractal. Um, and the first thing I'm going to recommend is ply magazine sock issue. You can't get it in print anymore that I know of. I haven't been able to find it anywhere. I'm, I have one, thankfully. But I was actually looking around today to see if I could find a link for you and I could not find it in print anywhere, but you can buy it digitally still. And it is literally an entire issue on spinning for socks. So that is such a wealth of knowledge. They experimented with how many plies, how to ply, is it okay to chain ply? What about a cable ply? Like they do so many different experiments. So I really love that issue and I highly recommend checking it out if you wanna kind of nerd out about sock spinning. I also recommend checking out the fleece, <laughs> blah, blah, blah fleece and fiber source book. I've mentioned that a lot on here. It's probably on my bookshelf. 
nope it's over on my other bookshelf i have a like spinning area over there so that is a great one too if you really want to get into the breed specific stuff and you want to pick a breed that okay this is gonna be great for socks um that book is such a treasure for that kind of knowledge i have had great luck with i i do think it's nice to use a longer staper Woo! a longer staple length for spinning for socks just for the added strength i have had pretty good luck with finn i've had dorset i've done dorset that worked out pretty well that one's recommended a lot um Coriadale, i think is a great one um and you can even search i've seen shops that sell their own sock blends even port fiber here uh in portland they have some really great blends that are beautiful for socks um they have like a south down shetland with silk i think is in it that i really love i actually turned that one into bats for my weekender so it's great for all kinds of spinning but yeah, just playing around and then taking notes so that you can see as you knit your socks, which ones are lasting the longest for you that you're like, okay, this was a good blend or this was a good breed that had some longevity and this is how I spun it. I can't tell you how valuable it is to take good notes while you're spinning. I sometimes get a little lazy with my note taking, but when it comes to spinning, I have definitely learned to take really good notes because you're going to forget. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think those are some of my favorites. If any of you have any favorites that you've had really good luck with your long lasting socks with your hand spun, please share that below. Cause I know we would all love to know. Next question. I heard you talking about fixing the length of a top down super wash sweater. What happens if you need to fix the length of a bottom up sweater? I knit my husband a bottom up broken rib vest using a super wash acrylic wool blend. I blocked it and he wore it a few times, but now it hangs off of his hips. Can't I just unravel from the bottom and re-knit a little narrower? So, I just want to touch really quick because you are saying a little bit of two different things. In the beginning, you're talking about fixing the length of the vest but when you talk about re-knitting then you're saying re-knitting it narrower so depending on if the issue is it grew wide or if it grew long we're kind of talking about two different things here so if it grew too long you can fix it it's just going to be a little finicky especially because you used oh no broken rib that's not a big deal okay so I was thinking fisherman's rib and then that gets a little tricky, but with broken rib, it should not be too challenging. What I recommend for something like this is when you end up unraveling your knits in the opposite direction from which they were knit. So your cast on edge is the edge that you have to unravel. It's a lot different when it's the bind off edge because then you just clip it and you can, you know, just unravel it. And then you have all your live stitches just like you want them, just like they were before you bound off. But when you are going from the bottom up and now you have to clip into that cast on edge, what I would do is if you can't find your tail hidden in there, I just cut like a little leg of one of those cast on stitches to unravel it. And then you'll just have a little bit of length of yarn you'll have to throw away, but that's not a big deal, especially when you're shortening something. And what is tricky is you cannot, you're gonna have a weird half stitch because you're coming out. So think of a knit stitch is like this, right? So as we're moving up and our knits look like little Vs, you're gonna be coming in from the top. So it's gonna be more like this. And so you don't have the same legs available to you if you were coming again from the direction you had originally knit it. So you're gonna have this one stitch that's gonna be a little half stitch. It's not that big of a deal. It can just feel a little confusing when you are getting, when you're unraveling and then trying to get that back on your needles. Um, so that's just a heads up. Just know you're gonna be a half stitch off when you get your needle back in. Um, so you'll need like a little leg to make up for that so that your ribbing can be the right amount of stitches. Now, the nice thing is, is if you just need to shorten this, you can pretty easily just unravel it to the length that will suit your husband better, put your needle back on, 
and then immediately go into ribbing and knit your ribbing for the hem of that vest. What's nice too is, well, I guess here's my question is, was the entire thing broken rib or did you have a different ribbing for the hem? Because again, you're now working in two different directions. So your stitches are not going to perfectly match. They're gonna look askew because you're going in two different directions. So if it was all broken rib, what I would probably recommend is still doing the hem in a ribbing so that it looks really polished and nice and you don't see this weird kind of adjustment from what you've done going in to shorten it. Um, but I think that's a really, really great option. If the vest also grew widthwise, maybe it just grew overall and so it's a little too wide around his hips, what you could do is get those stitches back on the needles and then do a decrease round. You know, especially for a lot of men, they tend to have broader shoulders and then they narrow down into their hips and waist. So if you look through a lot of, especially older pattern books, like Elizabeth Zimmerman, things like that, a lot of times what they would do is they would reduce the total amount of stitches by about 20%. So let's say you have 200 stitches on the needles, you would go ahead and decrease out 40 stitches right? Because 10% of 200 is 20. Yeah. Okay. That should be right. <laughs> so you do a quick decrease round, just spreading those out evenly and then do your ribbing. And that would kind of pull it in at his waist for him as well. So that's another option that you could do. I think that's it. Was there something else I was going to say there? I don't think so. Okay. I hope that helps. <laughs> All right. Last question. I have a question concerning my significant other and sizing patterns for him. He's a large man with very broad shoulders. To put it into more context, when I knit up a hat or mittens for him, 99% of the time I end up immediately having to figure out how to make the patterns larger for him since they often don't have an extra large or extra extra large size. I'm considering making him a sweater. Because of his shoulders, I'm not sure about selecting a size for him and measurements. He often has trouble even with standard everyday t-shirts because they get too tight in his shoulders and ends up having to go up a size to accommodate this. Should I include his, shoulder measure, his shoulders when doing the chest measurement or is this sort of thing normally already accounted for in a pattern with sizes and I, should I only do chest measurement? So. I definitely would do his chest measurement. You can't really do it around his shoulders as well because then you're getting his whole arm in there. What you don't want, I would assume, is for it to then look way too big on him because now what that designer made to fit around his chest is now wide enough to also accommodate his shoulders. So a couple things here. One option would be to... I just had so many ideas fly through my head all at once and now I'm trying to organize because I don't want to forget any. Okay, first of all, go into his closet and measure a sweater or a sweatshirt or something like that that he already has that fits him well. And take the chest measurement of that sweater and you might be able to base it on that and be like, okay, this fits him well and this is where it is in the chest. Number two, keep in mind that knit fabric is really forgivable. It's very stretchy. You know, like you can really, it should mold over his shoulders, maybe a little bit easier than something that doesn't quite have that flexibility, especially because depending on the sweater style, if it doesn't have any seams, it's gonna have even more flexibility than something with rigid seams in it. Uh, my third idea, bit of advice, however else I wanna say that, is I recommend starting with a top-down sweater for him. So I would do one that you can have him try on as you go so you can make sure, okay, it is fitting comfortably over his shoulders. And now that I have taken, now that I've separated the sleeves and the body, it's still fitting really well over the chest. Like you can have him try it on as you go. So I, that is definitely something I would recommend is doing top down. Keep in mind when you're doing top down that things do change as the sweater grows. The more weight you have on the sweater, so the body, and especially once you've added those sleeves, the sleeves pull down on the shoulders more than before you have them and kind of has everything lay a bit differently. Um, so yeah, those are my tips. 
measure something from his closet to help you pick the size. When you look at the sweater, most sweaters should come with a schematic. If there's not a little picture in there, there should at least be finished measurements. And so go compare those measurements. You could also compare like, okay, how big I would measure like the bicep of his sweater the one from his closet and then look at, okay, what's the upper arm circumference in the sweater I'm thinking of knitting him. Does that and the chest seem like a good fit? Because I think if both of those are close to something else in his wardrobe he already likes, then you're gonna be pretty safe in picking that size for him on that sweater pattern. Um, so there you go, I hope that helps. All right, everybody. I think that is about it. When I get back next week, we are going to be into our final month of the DRK March to May knit along. Uh, we are also quickly coming up on the end of the DRK spin it to knit it knit along. And I have spun my yarn. I have not knit my sweater. <laughs> There's some things I want to do with the pattern, but I'm like, okay, Andrea, you got to get on top of this. So, um, but anyways, I am going to be off hanging out with some knitters this weekend on Pender Island, and I'm super excited about it. I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. I hope you get to make something, and I very much hope to see you back here next week. Bye, everybody.